Now, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me back to the book of 1 Kings, and we are starting a new chapter. We're in chapter 21, uh, and uh, I hope that you have a copy of the outline. If you don't, uh, you can get it on the app. If you go on your phone, there's, uh, I'm sure there's some bulletins out there and out, out on the Welcome Center if you want to go back and get one. Uh, and uh, we're going to be looking at the first seven uh, verses, okay? And I'll give you a moment to get there. First Kings chapter 21, and we'll be looking at the first seven uh, verses. And let me say that this is the first part of a three-part study that we'll have here in chapter 21. Now, let me tell you this, and I want you to hear this. I want you to realize that it's not that I'm trying to kind of drag this thing out and make this chapter last longer. No, but what I want you to understand is there's just too much stuff here to try to cover or try to cram um, into one or maybe two uh, sermons because this passage, and this is what I want you to get, that it actually divides itself uh, down into three sections or three scenes like you would see in a play or a movie. So if you'll notice that I put on the title, this is, uh, is going to be scene one, okay? Of sowing wickedness and, and, and reaping wrath. This is scene one. So I want us to read chapter 21, the first seven uh, verses. And every time I look at this chapter 21, it makes me think of the great uh, Baptist preacher of years ago, a guy named R.G. Lee. Anybody ever heard of R.G. Lee? Yeah. He was pastor of Bellevue, where Adrian Rogers was for a long time. And um, he preached a sermon on this. It was called Payday Someday. He was famous for that. He probably preached it over a thousand times in his lifetime, traveling around, preaching everywhere. And, uh, and I think about him when we study this chapter because he preached on, 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 this, very, on, these te- on this chapter. Now, notice it begins chapter 21, verse uh, 1. It says, Now or and, it came about or it came to pass that after these things, meaning chapter 20 where God had intervened twice in and, and war for, for the Israelites, that Naboth, now he's a good guy, uh, but he pays for it, he's, all right? And I, we'll talk about it in a moment. The Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, okay, beside the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, give me, now that's the command in the Hebrew text. He says, now give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden, or King James says a garden of, of herbs, okay? Because it is close beside my house, and I will give you a better vineyard than it, than it in its place. Uh, and if you like, or if it seems good to you, I will give you the price or the worth of it in money. So the king makes the offer. Now look, you need to mark verse 3. Notice what we're told here. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord, that's Yahweh, forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. Now, look how Ahab responds here, all mature and grown up. So Ahab came into his house... Now, the New American Standard says sullen and vexed. King James says heavy and displeased, okay? Because the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him and said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned his away his face and he ate no food or literally bread, okay? So he wouldn't eat. But Jezebel... Now, you know things have got to be bad when Jezebel gets involved. Okay? All right? Now, notice what happens here. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, How is it that your spirit... Now, it's interesting, the word spirit there in Hebrew is ruach, R-U-A-C-H. And that's the same word that's used for the Holy Spirit sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's translated wind or breath, uh, but, uh, but it's the word ruach. So she said, how is it that your spirit is so sullen, or, or, or King James says sad, same word just used in verse 4, first part. Now notice she says um, that you are not eating food or, or bread. So he said to her, now he sounds like a little 
brat here. Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money or else. If it pleases you, I'll give you a vineyard in this place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. So he's going, I didn't get my way. Sounds like Baptist, doesn't it? Now, look at verse 7. And Jezebel's wife said to him, Do you now reign? King James says govern, but it's talking about being king. Do you reign over Israel? Arise, now that's the command, eat, that's another command, eat bread, and let your heart be uh, joyful, or King James says merry, because notice she says, I, emphatic pronoun in the text, she says, I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Now, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our study this morning. Father, I want to thank you for the, for the worship. Thank you for each one that's here whether they're in the sanctuary or online, God, would you speak? And for the next few moments, take away distractions and hindrances. And Lord, tune our hearts to your word. And if there's somebody lost, I pray today would be their day of salvation. And Father, we all need to hear this, so speak to us. And we'll give you honor and glory for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, before we get in the text, I want to just mention a couple things to you, Okay kind of set this up. Now, first of all, let me say that in the physical um, and, and, and really the scientific world uh, and realm, uh, there is this, this law um, that says, and you've heard this, that for every action, there's an equal and opposite what? Reaction, okay? That's true in the, in the scientific uh, physical realm, but you know what? It's, it's, it's also true in the spiritual realm. And, and just like in the physical realm, for example, you know, if I hit my finger with a hammer, which I'm prone to do, I can't even drive a nail, but if I hit my finger with a hammer, then my, ha- my finger has to absorb all the force, the energy that's created by the swing. Now, that sounds all scientific, but it just means, man, it's going to hurt, okay? Well, likewise, in the spiritual realm, uh, there is also a law about our actions and, and the, and the uh, results that it produces. And it's found in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Many of you know this. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Okay? And, and, and it is true that we reap what we sow. And I want to tell you from my own personal experience, I can tell you there have been times, many times, when I've experienced trouble and pain and adversity in my life. But you know what? It's because I have gotten out of the will of God, got, it, got into doing what I wanted to do. And you know what? I brought it on myself. Okay? And I tell people this. Now listen, any person, doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not, doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not, Anytime anyone disregards what God says is wrong and right, that ultimately they will suffer and they will reap the consequences of their actions. I always tell people, you've heard me say this, if you jump in the water, you get wet. If you jump in the fire, you get burned. If you jump off the top of a building, you don't have to believe in gravity. You can say, well, I don't believe in gravity. I say, well, go ahead, jump off. You'll see. Well, it's the same thing. Whether you believe in God or not, He made this universe, and spiritual laws work just like physical laws. If you break them, uh, you'll get hurt. Now, secondly, with this in mind, let me say this. As we we pick up here in chapter 21, we find Ahab and Jezebel sowing evil seeds in their lives, which they did all their lives. And what we're going to see is, is these seeds will quickly... I want you to look back with me at verse 43 of chapter 20, the last verse in chapter 20. So the right at the one that we're uh, getting to. Notice, notice what we're told here. It says, So the king of Israel went to his house. Now the King James says, Heavy and displeased. New American Standard that I'm using says, Sullen and vexed. NIV says, Sullen and angry. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about these two words again in a moment down in verse 4. But the thing that we need to remember and and keep in mind, and we've seen this, 
that King Ahab has already witnessed uh, firsthand God's miraculous power, how he worked in Israel, just like on Mount Carmel, when he sent the fire down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, and he proved that he was the one true God and not some false god, Baal. Okay? Now, also... uh, Furthermore, as we saw last week in chapter 20, that Ahab had experienced God's divine inter- intervention, and, and not once, but twice, God had intervened and allowed the Israelites to defeat the Syrians or the Arameans in battle, and they were more numerous, much more superior uh, army. And as we saw last time, at the end of chapter 20, at verse 42, Through an unnamed prophet, God severely chastises O Ahab because he did not fully uh, obey God's will and God's commandment to eliminate Ben-Hadad. He's supposed to kill Ben-Hadad, and he lets Ben-Hadad live. Now, we would think that by this time that O Ahab would say, you know, I I need to confess my sin and repent And I need to get right with God because God's been working and he's been been using me and and blessing me. And I need to get with the program and I need to make him Lord of my life and grow in my relationship with him and lead my nation that way. But instead of doing that, instead of being repentant and receptive to God's will... We've just seen that O Ahab, in verse 43, goes home sulking and brooding and pouting like a spoiled brat. Okay? Now, with all that said, let's go to verses 1 and 2 and our first main point. Now, first of all, we're going to see the selfish request. Okay? Now, it's important to notice here, and I put this in your outline, that the sole focus of Ahab is on himself and the tension of himself, and his wicked uh, desires, selfish desires. Now, now look what happens. Verse 21, chapter 1. Now are ands, continuing from the last chapter, it came about, it came to pass, after these things, after the wars. Now notice it says, that Naboth, now, you may want to write this in your Bible. I, I didn't put it in your outline. I, I started doing it. I said, well, but I'll just tell you. You know what Naboth's uh, name means? Now, listen, it means sprout, and it means fruit, or it means produce. Now, I don't know about you. That's a good name for a guy who owns a vineyard. Hey, it's kind of like a guy named uh, Bologna or Salami that owns a deli. Okay? Okay, now, now Naboth's a good man. Now look, look, the Jezreelite, and I'll talk about it in a moment, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, so he's in Jezreel. Notice it says, beside the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Now look at verse 2. Now Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, give me. Now that's the command, okay? Now remember, he's the king. He says, give me your vineyard that I may have it. Now, now the King James says, for a garden of herbs. New American Standard that I'm using says, uh, for a vegetable garden. Now, the word translated here means something that, can, that is green or even yellow. So, of course, it's talking about vegetables that are plants. And I can just tell you straight up, I, I could never be a vegetarian. There's something wrong with somebody that wants just to eat plants all the time. My favorite vegetable is meat, okay? My favorite sweet is meat. The best, best dish in all the world is a double cheeseburger. Ketchup, mustard, and pickles. Then you got, you got dessert. I mean, you got green on it. You got, you got tomatoes. You got everything you need. All the food groups right there, okay? Now, notice what he says here. He says... I want your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it's close beside my house and I will give you a better vineyard than than it in its place. And if you were like, or King James says, if it seems good to thee, I will give you the price or the worth of it and money. Now, now folks, as we talked about this um, a moment ago, 
God had been doing some great and, and just miraculous things in uh, the nation of Israel. He, he had shown himself to be God on Mount Carmel. He had given them victory over the Syrians or the Aramaeans twice uh, in a row. And so therefore, while the iron was hot and there was some momentum in the country, Uh, Instead of trying to buy more real estate and fulfill his own selfish desires, uh, what uh, King Ahab should have been doing was he should have been leading his people and his nation in a time of national repentance and revival and turning people's uh, hearts back toward God. I mean, God had been working in a great way and everything was set up for Ahab to turn people's hearts to the Lord. But you know what? Yet Ahab, what he does is he breaks the Tenth Commandment by coveting the, his neighbor's vineyard located there by his winter palace in a place called Jezreel. Now, you may want to make you a, a note here. Jezreel was located, it's a part of the valley of Armageddon. Okay? And so, so very valuable uh, land there, okay? And there's no doubt that O Ahab thinks that he's made such a sweet deal to Naboth that there's no way he's going to turn this down because this is just too good. This is from the king. He's got to take my deal. Now, this brings us to verse 3 and our second main point. Now, we're already on number 2, all right? Now, first of all, we've seen the selfish request... Give me, give me that vineyard. Now, number two, we're going to see the scriptural refusal, okay? Now, I want to read verse three, and then I want to spend a few moments on it because this is so good. Now, notice what we're told here. But Naboth said to uh, Ahab, The Lord forbid me that I should give you the inheritance of uh, my father's. So, folks, what we see here, instead of him jumping, Naboth Naboth jumping at the king's offer, what we see here is that Naboth says, no deal, I can't sell you uh, my land. Okay? Now, realize the reason he can't sell his property is not because he has a problem with the price and he didn't offer him a good enough deal. That's really got nothing to do with it. But it is the fact he can't sell because he has a conviction he uh, based on the written word of God that had been given to them uh, from Moses uh, in the Old Testament. Okay? Now, now, folks, I want you to listen to me. And you may want to write this down. If you don't have a cross-reference Bible, you ought to write it out in the margin. Now, I've got one, but I still wrote it in there. Uh, and I put it in your outline. Uh, Leviticus chapter 25, notice it's 23 through 28, and Numbers 36, 7. You ought to write those sometime. They're in your outline. You ought to write it where you have it and go back and look it up sometime. But in these verses, they explain how God instructed the, uh, the Israelites not to sell their ancestral tribal allotments given to them. Because you remember when Joshua brought them into the promised land and they conquered it, It was doled out to the 12 tribes by lots, which God directed. And God had given all the 12 tribes specific areas in the Holy Land, two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan. Okay? Is everybody with me? Okay. Now, now, God wanted the land to stay in the possession of the original owners And that's why God gave some very detailed, specific laws and regulations that really relegated the the buying and selling of property. Now, it was all tied in with the year of Jubilee. Anybody ever heard of the word Jubilee? Raise your hand if you've heard of that. Yeah, okay. Now, you know this, that the Israelites, God's people, he had given them a Sabbath day Every seven days, okay? And then every seven years, it was a sabbatical year. They were to work the land six years, and on the seventh year, they were supposed to let it uh, lay fallow and not work it, okay? Then, 
you had a super Sabbath called Jubilee. It was seven years times seven is 49. And on the 50th year, it was a year of Jubilee. Now, the main thing that happened on Jubilee was that land that had been sold reverted back to its original owner and, and debts were canceled and all kind of things happened. And understand, one main reason God had given these laws was to prevent a few wealthy people or families from monopolizing everything and taking all the land away from the people. So the year of Jubilee helped to keep the economy fair and, and balanced. If you went into, if you got in, a, in an economic tailspin, you could sell some land uh, and it was based on how much time was left before it went back to, to the original owner, okay? And, and, and so, so it helped keep things fair and balanced. But listen, here's the main reason God had commanded them not to sell their land. Now, everybody listening to me? Does everybody, everybody, everybody say amen? amen. Okay? Because some of you is kind of zoning out. Wake up. Okay? Now, I want you to listen to me. The reason, the main reason... God said, don't sell your land, is because in reality, it didn't belong to them in the first place. You know who it belonged to? God. He created it, He made it, and He gave them their tribal areas. He said, this is where I want the tribe of Judah, this is where I want the tribe of Benjamin, this is where I want the tri tribe of Asher. Uh, and so, they were to stay in those places. And... It belonged to God, and they were just the tenants, the pilgrims, passing through life, and they were just using it while they were there. And you know what? It's a good thing to stop. Here we are, uh, 2,000 years past the Old Testament days, three, almost 3,000 years when this was written, okay? And, but it's good to be reminded of this truth from time to time, that as human beings, we don't really own anything that we have because in reality, it all belongs to God. Okay? And He just lets us use it during our earthly lives for a while before we die. Okay? And so we are to be good stewards. And that's why it's called stewardship. The word steward literally means to manage the house. Okay? And he just gives you stuff, and he lets you manage his stuff during your earthly life. And, and you know, and I, you've heard me say this. People say, well, no, my, my name's on that deed. I paid for it, preacher. I just say, no, it's still not yours. It's God's. Because when you die, guess what? You won't take it with you. You won't take it up, and you won't take it down. Okay? It belongs to God. And that's why we call it stewardship, because we want to manage and glorify God in everything that do, even how we handle the stuff that He lets us have. Okay? And so we want to manage it well. So, therefore, understanding this background for Naboth's refusal, you see, he, it was scriptural. He's standing on the, on the Word of God. So, in verse 3 here, we see a great example of a godly man who stands by his convictions, and he does what he knows is right. And here's what I like to say. You ought to write this somewhere. Naboth was not for sale. Okay? He wasn't for sale. He would not compromise his faith and convictions to put more financial gain in his pockets. Now, I want to stop here. And I want to make this very, just very practical and very personal, okay? Now, let me just ask you this. And I just want you to think about yourself. Is there any area or, or somewhere in your life that you're willing to get, negotiate a price for even though you know that God says that it's wrong and you shouldn't do it? You know, there's a lot of people that are for sale. And I'll tell you something, for me personally, 
There's some things I'm not going to do. I don't care. Listen, uh, I couldn't work at a casino. I couldn't work at a beer factory or drive a beer truck. There's certain things. I don't care if you offered me a million dollars a year to do it. I wouldn't do it. You know why? Because I have the conviction that all that's wrong and against what Scripture says. And so... I don't care what they offer me. There's some things that I won't do. And you see, Naboth wasn't for sale. And realize, just like people today, Naboth could have rationalized this, this decision that he made because after all, it's the king. It's like the president who lived beside you. Can imagine you had something? I'm sure some of y'all own something in Martha's Vineyard, okay? Um, you can imagine trying to uh, buy some property there. And, 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 and he could rationalize and said, well, you know, uh, I'm going to get to rub elbows with, with royalty. Man, I might in, increase my social standing and move up the socioeconomic ladder because after all, isn't that the American dream? We just, we got to make more. See? That, it's all about money, right? That's what they tell us. But you know what? Naboth wasn't for sale. And he could have took it and then turned around and sold land. You know, he could have took a better vineyard and turned around and sold it for a windfall profit. Stuck the money in his pocket. Not even had to do the work of keeping up the land. But you know what? He doesn't do it. And, and, and although it would have been the easy thing to do, but there's just one problem with it. You know what the problem was? And they boss Old Testament context. Now listen to me. In his covenant context with God... Yahweh, God had told them not to do it. Not take the king's bait. Okay? Now, let me say one other thing. Take this one step further before we go on, and I want you to listen to me. Naboth did what was right and godly. Okay? All right? But as we're going to see down in verse 13 of this chapter, next time. We won't get there this time, but we'll get there next time. So I'm going to kind of... Uh, what your appetite here next time we're going to see that this right biblical decision costs Naboth dearly because you know why it cost him his life so therefore in the short term instead of his obedience bringing him blessing and reward his obedience brought him death now think about that. He got killed for doing the right thing. Kind of reminds you of somebody, doesn't it? The Lord Jesus. Now, let me tell you this. If we looked at this from just a worldly, secular human perspective, then we would look at Naboth and say, Naboth, you're crazy. Why didn't you jump at that offer and give the king that land and take more and get a lot back? But instead, you say no, and you get yourself killed. So the world would look at him and say, you're nuts. But I want you to understand and, and listen to me. And, and this is where you got to always think. And, and it's hard because this goes against the world and, 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 and their paradigm of thinking. But here's you, what you got to do from an eternal spiritual heavenly perspective from God's divine viewpoint I want you to hear me folks now listen it is better to die for doing right than it is to live and prosper for doing wrong Everybody hear that? Let me say that again. It's better to die for doing right than it is to live and even prosper for doing wrong. And the reason I say that is true is because this world and this present earthly life is not the end. This is not all there is because we are going to live for eternity in one of two places. We're either going to go to heaven or we're going to go to hell. And we're going to be there for eternity. And I always tell people this. That's why the Lord Jesus always pushed and moved people from the temporary earthly things 
to the spiritual, heavenly, eternal things. For example, in John's Gospel, chapter 4, don't turn there, but you remember he meets a woman at the well, and she's looking for well water, and he lets her know, hey, this is not really what you need, because you drink this, you're going to be thirsty again. And then he proceeds to tell her that he's the living water. See, in John chapter 6, and I love this story. We just studied it the other night. We're, we're in the midst of it in Mark on Wednesday nights. But, uh, but in Jesus feeding the 5,000, the next day the crowds are hunting him again because they want some more food. Can imagine? Here's a guy who can make food go a long ways. Boy, that'd save you on your grocery bill, wouldn't it? And he tells them, don't work for food to fill your stomach. But you need to look for the food that saves your soul. And then he, he, he preaches that he's the bread of life. See, he pointed them from the physical to the spiritual and eternal. And that's what we're seeing here. Uh, because, listen, Naboth wouldn't sell because he's standing on the word of God. And as Christians, we always have to evaluate and assess and view every decision, everything we do against the backdrop of eternity. Because think about it, folks, how foolish it is for folks to forfeit or lose eternal blessings, okay? And you lose them for temporary, passing, uh, physical, and, and earthly pleasures. I mean... When you view it against the backdrop of eternity, it, it, it's not even a blimp on the radar screen. And it's not, it's not worth it. And so, let me say again, that Naboth is a good example of living uh, by conviction and saying it's better to fulfill God's word than it is to fill our pockets. Now, having said that, let's go to verses 4 through 7, our third and final main point. Now, can you believe that? We're already number 3. All right, now thus far, we have seen the selfish request, we have seen the scriptural refusal. Now thirdly, we're going to see the sinful reprisals, and they're twofold, um, okay? First of all, we're going to see Ahab's pouting. Now, th this, is, this is so, I mean, it's almost funny. Now look, look what happens, verse 4. So Ahab, Naboth just told him no. So Ahab came into his house, now... My New American Standard says, sullen and vexed. King James says, heavy and displeased. The NIV is good. It says, sullen and angry. Now, folks, realize, first of all, let me point out, these are exact same two words that were, that were used back in chapter 20, verse 43. Same two. Now, put this in your outline so you'd have this. It's interesting. The first word translated here as heavy or sullen is the Hebrew word sar, S-A-R, okay? And the word sar comes from a root which means to be stubborn and rebellious, and it's an attitude which rejects and resists instruction and, repro and reproof and correction, okay? And it actually the same word used in the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 16, listen, where God calls the nation of Israel... A stubborn heifer. Hey, God calls somebody a stubborn fat cow. Okay? Now, how would you like to be called a stubborn heifer? Well, folks, that's what God called the nation of Israel. And I want to tell you something. And you need to hear this from your pastor. People are getting on thin ice and they're in a dangerous condition spiritually when you get to the point to where nobody can correct you or rebuke you about what you're doing. Now you think about it. When you get to where you can't be told you're doing wrong, you're in sad spiritual shape. And sometimes as a pastor, it's a hard thing. I don't like confrontation. Pastors hate confrontation. Boy, that's really what I want to do is I really want to stir up trouble. Boy, that really makes my job a good and easy. But there's times when you got to say, hey, you're, you're out of line. You're missing it, and you need to get right. And I'm going to tell you, it's a hard thing to do. But when you get to where you can't be told that, 
there's something bad wrong in your spiritual life. Now, look at the second word. Not only was he sar, heaven and heavy and sullen, but the second word translated here as vex or displeased or angry. The root means to fret, to be enraged, to be filled with indignation because word, the word literally means the root means to boil up. Okay? And, and same word used in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 15, to describe the raging of the sea. And like the first word, this word has the sense in it, the nuance of rage and anger, which comes from being uh, corrected. Again, it just has that thing about, and you know, it's something about human nature. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. We don't really like to be told what to do, do we? Be honest. Don't act all spiritual out there. You don't like to be told what to do, do you? That's one reason Paul says the Old Testament law, in a way, worked against you because it it kind of pushed us towards sin because when you're told not to do, then you want to do it. See? And, and, and that's what this word really, really means. Now, let's finish verse 4. Now, look what he does. So Ahab came into his house, sullen, heavy, sour, and vexed, and angry, because of the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him. For he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my father. Okay? Now, look what he says here. And, and, and this is so funny. He says... Uh, I will not give you an inheritance of my father's. And he lay down on his bed, and he turned away his face, and he ate no bread or, or, or no food or literally no, no, no bread. So what we see here is a pouting, really pathetic king Ahab. Uh, his attitude is one of stubbornness and rebellion, and his heart is full of rage and anger. Uh, he's acting like a spoiled brat who's, who's had his toys taken away. You know a good southern translation of this? He's pitching a hissy fit. You ever heard of that before? I didn't hear my grandma saying that. You having a hissy fit, son. Okay? And... And I want you to realize that here's the thing that, that, that when confronted with Naboth's godly example, the king should have been convicted. He should have been corrected. He should have said, you know what? I, I need to learn from this example. But rather than, than learning from it, he stomps home and, and he, he just turns his face to the wall and he says, you know what, I'm not going to eat my dinner or where I'm from it's called supper, okay? If you're, if you're uptown, it's dinner, all right? But he says, I'm not going to eat. You know what he reminds me of? You ever seen a kid get mad? I'm going to hold my breath. Of course, I always tell them, hold it. Have at it because you won't die. If holding your breath would die, there would be a lot of kids dead. They, you're not going to die because you're going to start breathing before you die. And I just see Ahab. He just, he's acting like a two-year-old. Okay? Now, let's go to verses 5 through 7. And we move from his pouting. We're going to talk about Je- Jezebel's probing. And obviously when she gets involved, it can't be good. Now, let's go to verses 5 and 6. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, How is it that your spirit is so sullen, or King James says sad. It's actually the same word just used in verse 4, sar. Okay? So he says, she says, why, why are you acting like this? He said, she said that you're not eating food or you're not eating your bread. In other words... He said, you're not eating your supper. What's wrong with you? Now, look what he says in verse 6. Now, this is so good. So he said to her, I've got a lot on my mind. I'm the king, and I've got a lot of administrative things to handle. Is that what he says? No, look what he says. Because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I'll give you a vineyard in his place. But he said, I will not give you the vineyard. Now, think about it. 
Basically, what Ahab says to Je- Jezebel's question is, is that I'm mad because I'm not getting my way. You could translate it like that. Okay? And, and let me ask you, isn't this pitiful? T- tell the truth. But you know what? What's so bad that Ahab's a good example of how many chur- how a lot of church members and a lot of Christians act sometimes when they don't get what they want. And, and uh, that's why I say Ahab probably got a little bit of badness in him. Okay? Because he wants to have his way. I want my, I want my way. Now, look, look, at, look at verse 7. Now, notice what Jezebel does here. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, now, she asked a question. Now, the New American Standard says, do you now reign over Israel? Or King James says, do you now govern the kingdom of Israel? Now, the NIV is a good prayer phrase and says, is this how you act as the king of Israel? So, in other words, she's saying, she's kind of being condescending and sarcastic. Now, I know none of you could ever be that way. But you know what? She's basically saying, and you are the king, right? Is that how kings act? Now, now, notice what she does. She gives them some commands. She says, arise. That's a command. Eat bread. That's a command. She says, let your heart be joyful. Or King James says, Mary. She says, I. And that's an emphatic pronoun in the Hebrew text. You don't really have to have it in there but, because it's in the verb. But... Uh, it's put there for emphasis. She says, I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Okay? So she says, start acting like a king. I'll take care of it all. And as the curtain closes on this first scene, okay? Scene one, Queen Jezebel is now poised to take center stage. And she is going to concoct an evil, satanic witch's brew of poison against a righteous, godly man named Naboth. Now, just quickly, before I close, and we have a time of invitation, but don't get antsy now, don't jump around yet, don't leave. I want to give you three things, and I put them in your outline, three practical applications and these are three things not to do. So many times I tell you what to do. Here's what not to do. First of all, I want you to notice here, I put this in your outline, King Ahab was focused on feeding his flesh rather than feeding his faith. Okay? And you talking about in America, that's the way it is. But I want you to hear me. The Lord Jesus knows that we need things to live. He knows that we need food, we need clothes, we need a house. We need things to live. But yet, the Lord doesn't want our life just to consist of searching and working and living for things. Because what happens is, you don't own them, the things own you. That's why... Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek ye first, present tense imperative, continue seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall what? Be added unto you. See, you always put the spiritual in priority over the physical. And if moms and dads and men and women and boys and girls and teenagers and all would do that, it would change their walk with the Lord because walking with the Lord takes discipline. It takes deliberate intensity and being intentional. And you got to be in the Word. You got to be praying. You got to be faithful to the Lord. You got to be, hey, to have a growing relationship with Him. It doesn't happen by accident. That's why a lot of Baptists are backslidden and they're not, they're not living the way they're supposed to live because they're caught up in the things of the world. They wouldn't be at work. You know, it drives me crazy. People come to church late, but they never go to work like that because they'd get fired. Now, who's God? The boss man or God? And I always tell people, people will do stuff at work, but you can't get them to do anything at church. And again, who's God in their life? 
Now, now, there's a lot else I could say, but I want to move on. Number two, Ahab was flagrantly forsaking God's law rather than following the Lord. Because you see, Ahab should have learned from Naboth's godly example to stand on Scripture, okay? But he wouldn't do it. And let me just remind you again, you don't even have to be a Christian, but if you break God's laws, you really don't break God's law because in the end, you get broken by them. And you know what? That's why I always tell people, be careful because, you know what? Prevention is always better than cure. And boy, I've learned that in my life. Now let me give you the third thing. Queen Jezebel was facilitating treachery rather than truth. And I always tell people this, that any time we choose to go wrong rather than doing right, then you know what? Uh, we're going we're to suffer. And you know, whether it's a secret plan to embezzle money from your, from your job, from your business... And you know, you see that happen from time to time. Well, eventually, you're going to get caught. Well, maybe, it's, maybe you're thinking about having an affair on your mate. Well, guess what? Eventually, it's going to come to light. No matter what you do, I, it may be that you're going to plan to hurt somebody like Jezebel did. There's a lot of that going on in the world today where people are taking revenge on people. But let me tell you something. Know that ultimately, truth will come to light. And in the process, you're going to hurt a lot of people along the way. So, it brings us back to what I asked you earlier. Are you for sale in your life? Is there something that you would do for, for gain rather than following what God says? Let me tell you something. I just want to say again. It's better to suffer for doing wrong than it is to be given a lot and, 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 and you don't do right. And don't let anybody in the world either to ever try to push you in the wrong way. And that's why I tell people sometimes, be careful what you do. Be careful what you say. Because I want to tell you, in the end, we reap what we sow. And just, I can hear Charles Stanley say this. You reap what you sow, you reap longer than you sow, and you reap more than you sow. And so be careful about what you do. 